So here's 25 really short questions to test all your, your knowledge of the basic rules of derivatives. And so let's do a three minute, a three minute uh, test where you're going to see how many you can get in of these in three minutes. So at 946, I'll, I'll reveal the answers and see how many you can remember. Okay, so go. Everyone's you're working on these. If you want to ask questions in the chat, you can do that uh, or, or verbally if you want. Uh, but let's just spend the next three minutes seeing how many. Now these are derivatives, not antiderivatives. This is, you know, Calc 1 derivatives. Okay, go for it. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so I put, uh, if you haven't noticed yet, I put all the answers up. So, how did you do? Any questions? These are derivatives, right? So if we're gonna, if we're gonna be good at antiderivative going backwards, then we got, we got to know our derivatives really well. Got to recognize when we have functions like these, what, what the function that it's the derivative of, so we can do antiderivatives. Any questions? Mark, do you want to record? I am recording. Okay. Okay. Why is this zero? Pi to the minus ninth. It's not that there's no variable. What is pi to the minus nine? It's just a value. It's just a number, right? It's just a value. So it, it doesn't change, right? There's no, so the rate of change is zero, right? So it's a, it's a constant. It's just like y equals four, pi to the minus nine. So just because there's an exponent on there doesn't mean that, that you're going to use the power rule. It's only the power rule if it's x to an exponent. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so now let's talk about some harder ones. Um, the first kind of, uh, so, so, so uh, a straightforward antiderivative would be like you have something like one of, something like this that I've written, or a constant multiple of it, and you have to just rewrite the original function. So for, for instance, if you, have, if you have the rate of change function four sine x, all right, well that's, that's a constant negative four times this, right? So then the antiderivative would be negative four cosine x. Okay. So th those kinds of those kinds of antiderivatives should be we just kind of think about it and write it down. But then there's other rate functions that are harder, and we need to 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 work a little bit, you know, to to develop some techniques or or uh, strategies to do those. Can I erase these? Okay, I'm going to erase. So let's look at. So chain rule practice. Okay, so some more complicated derivatives means more, more difficult antiderivatives. So now we want to practice the chain rule. So each of these are composite functions, one function, an interior function, and then kind of an exterior function, one function like kind of plugged into another, and that requires the chain rule. Okay, so see how you do on these. Okay, I trust you're working on these.
Okay. How does it look? Any questions? Or maybe I made a mistake. Do you think I made a mistake? Or any questions on those? So if this, if you're not confident with this, uh, you're gonna have a lot of trouble. So you got to go back and brush up on your, on your chain rule from the mastery test. You did the mastery test, and actually, um, I'll be providing like a lot of a whole bunch of practice of just these chain rule derivatives because the better you can see what's happening here in the chain rule, the better we'll be able to what we're gonna say undo it, right? So, so given a function like this, a rate function over here. We need to like undo the chain rule and, and recover this original function back over here. So, so the, uh, the, the, the better that you understand and can do the chain rule, uh, the better you'll be able to do it backwards. Okay, so it's, we're doing like in reverse or undo it. Okay, so uh, what is, so let's notice the pattern here, right? So we have uh, what we took the derivative of the exterior function leaving the interior as it is, times the derivative of the interior. And it's the same thing each time. Derivative in the exterior, the big picture, leaving the interior as it is, times the derivative of the interior. So this, this thing, this derivative of the interior is going to be our check, our initial check, to make sure that this was a chain rule derivative in the first place and that we're gonna apply this kind of reverse chain rule, okay? So, so we're looking for one term like this that is the derivative of, or just any constant multiple of the derivative of the interior of the other part, right? So this is the derivative of that, but it could be any constant multiple too, which would work, right? This is the derivative of the interior. This is the derivative of the interior. Okay, so that's what that's going to be our initial check to see if this strategy is going to apply. We're going to check to see if we have as one factor of our rate function, one factor is going to be the derivative of the interior of the other or a constant multiple of it. So that's going to be our initial check. Okay, and then what's going to happen? So when we, all right, and so let's, let's go on. Any, any questions on these chain rule derivatives? Okay. What's that? No. <laughs> okay. All right. So again, yeah. So and we'll we'll talk about that again. But again, we got these the thing that's chained on, right? The thing that's chained on. We're looking for that to be the derivative of the inside. If it's not, if it's not derivative or any constant multiple of the derivative, like for instance, the exponent is the important thing. So any 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 multiple of x to the third is going to work for this. But if this exponent is anything other than other than three, this wasn't a chain rule derivative. Okay, make sense? All right, let's let's uh, kind of form or take a look here. Oops. Okay, so let's let's talk strategy here. So here's the chain rule. What's the derivative of g f of x? And we just practiced that, right? We just practiced that. The derivative of g f of x is g prime f of x times f prime of x. And that's exactly what we saw in those four examples that we just did, right? Derivative of the kind of the big picture exterior function times the derivative of the interior. Okay, so antiderivative is going to be something like this. We're going to start, our rate function is going to look like this. And we want to recover the original function. And the, the first thing we said was we're going to do a check. We're going to make sure that this is the derivative of that interior function. Okay. And then once we've, uh, once we've established that, once we've established we have this form, then we're asking ourselves, what are we going to focus on over here to recover g of f of x? Is it going to be exhibit A or exhibit B? What's going to be our focus? What has the information that we need to recover g f of x? Exhibit A or exhibit B? So someone's saying exhibit A. Does exhibit B have enough information for us to get G of f of x? No. No, it doesn't have anything to do with G, right? 
But this has everything we need, and it's just one little step away, right? So we're going to focus on this, right? Once we've established that we have this, have this form, then all we need to do is focus on this, right? And we have one, really one step to do, and that's do what will the approach? We're just going to do the antiderivative of the exterior function of that of that part of it, and this goes away because. It, it kind of it pulled out when we did the derivative, so it's going to collapse back in when we do antiderivative. Okay, so what's our approach? We're going to check for, make sure we have the right form, right? Make sure that this is the derivative or a constant multiple of this. And then we're going to write the antiderivative of the exterior function of g, keeping f as it is. And that's, we're almost, once we do that, we'll be almost done. We just have to figure out any constant multiples that we need to to change, right? So it's just kind of, we gotta clean up a little mess, right? So there might be a, we need an extra two or an extra one third or something like that. Okay, so does that make sense so far before we get into examples? Okay, and so for those of you who, um, and maybe in Calc 1 or in, in high school, um, you learned something called U substitution, okay? And that was for doing problems like this. And so we're going to use we're going to learn use substitution later for for different ones. But we're not going to I'm not going to encourage you to use use substitution for this type of problem. And um, the reason is there's a couple reasons for that. And the the first is um, again it's like learning a whole new rather than rather than bridging from our knowledge of the chain rule. It's like learning something new, right? So it's like it's you're like learning something new. And then on top of that, once you uh, get a little practice and get it good at this, it takes about one third of the work and the time as doing a U substitution. Okay, so if you can, you know, give this a try. If you, you know, some some students cling very tightly to U substitution, they love it. Okay, but I'm, what I'm telling you is, if you can start gaining some um, some a little bit of uh, ability to do this it's going to cut the time and the writing by down by like a third. It's, 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 it's a way more efficient process. And then again, it's focusing, it's, uh, it's based on our knowledge of the chain rule that we already know. Okay, so here we go. So here's the thing I showed you in the last. So here's an example. Uh, we've got the antiderivative of x cubed 8 plus x to the fourth to the fifth dx. So before we get into doing this antiderivative, uh, my question is, what is what's a little bit different about this integral than all the ones we've been doing before? What's different here? This is a product. Okay. It's an yeah. Integral. What's that? It's an integral. Okay. We've 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 done a lot of integral expressions. What's different about this integral expression than the ones we've done? We have to find. Comes to x to the third in front of it. Okay. There's no bounds, right? There's no bounds. So we've had lots of complicated products, lots of complicated rate functions. And, you know, like our surface area rate functions were products and really complicated. So this, in terms of the rate function, this isn't, this isn't anything new. Okay. But what's new is the fact that there's no bounds on there. So what it, so what that means is this is called an indefinite integral. Okay. It's an indefinite integral. And what it means is it's the same as what we've been doing. a to the x, t cubed, 8 plus t to the fourth to the fifth, dt. Okay, but it's for all, so, so this is not just one function now, this is many, 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 many functions because it's for any value of a, for any starting value x equals a. So rather than get one, one a net accumulation function, this is like a whole family of net accumulation functions. It's like an, it's an infinite number of accumulation functions because it's, it's every one of these net accumulation functions for every starting value of a such that our quantity has this rate. So when you do an indefinite integral, you're really finding, you're finding a whole family of net accumulation functions 
for any starting value a, not a specific one. So last times when we wrote our net accumulation functions, we said we're going to start at 2 or we're going to start at 0, right? And that's, that would just be one net accumulation function. But let a be any starting value, and then you get like, you get all the net accumulation functions for that rate of change. Does that make sense? Okay, so the first couple we'll do this way. We'll just work on the antiderivative this way, and we'll just practice, you know, the, the uh, using the bounds. And then, and then after a while, then we'll just we won't we won't write it out this way. We'll just work it out this way, knowing that this means this. Okay. All right, so now we've got do the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check to make sure we have the right form here. Do we have a chain rule form, and how do we know that? So we got to look at is one of them the derivative or is one of the terms the derivative or a constant multiple of the derivative of the other of of, of the interior of the other? So do we have that? Is the, is this uh, is the check? satisfied for, for this being a chain rule derivative? No. Okay, why not? Um, because it, the outer says t to the power of 3 in the inner. If you do take the derivative, it's going to be 4t to the power of 3. Okay, so if you take the derivative of the inside, you get 4t cubed. And what do we have? t cubed. t cubed. Does that mean that it's not chain rule? Yeah, so remember with derivatives, a constant multiple doesn't fade us. It fades us. It just comes along for the ride, right? So constant multiples don't don't influence functions. They can just with derivatives and antiderivatives, they just come along. I see. Okay. Now makes sense. So what's important on. here is that we have the power right. Is this power right in terms of the derivative of this? Yeah. Yes. The power is what we need. We need something to the third. We need t to the third. We have t to the fourth. So yeah, so this, this checks out, we can do it. So now where are we gonna focus? Are we gonna focus on exhibit A or exhibit B? If we're gonna, so we're not gonna undo, this was a chain rule derivative and we're gonna undo it. Where are we gonna focus, exhibit A or exhibit B? B. Exhibit B, exhibit B is like our G prime F of X. And what are we gonna do? We're just gonna look at the big picture and do the antiderivative. So what's the big picture function here? It's the function raised to the sixth power. Yeah, so we have something to the fifth. The antiderivative will be then to the sixth, like she said, right? So, so this is the reverse power rule now. So it's gonna, we're going to raise the power. And if we have a six, then we're going to need one sixth, thinking about taking the derivative. Okay, and so what we're going to do is we're going to call, so this is, this is like g prime f of x, right? We did the, the antiderivative of this thing to the fifth is one sixth of it to the sixth. We're not gonna write this, right? Cause it's gonna collapse back in, okay? And so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the derivative of it and check it, right? So this is kind of like a, this is our, what we're gonna call the first attempt. And we're gonna take the derivative of it. And if we get exactly the function we were given, we're done, the first attempt was right, okay? But if not, then we might have to, to make a second attempt and uh, adjust this. So here we go. Derivative, chain rule, right? Six times, one sixth, eight plus t to the fourth, to the fifth, times what? Four t cubed. So now, is it exactly the rate function we were given? No. So now we're gonna tr we're gonna. Uh, Revise our first attempt. What, so what's different about it? We have this 4, right? We have this 4, we have an extra factor of 4 that's not here. So what do we need to do to the first attempt to so that when we take the derivative of it, the 4 won't be there? Yep, so we need another 1 fourth. If we have a 1 fourth, so 1 fourth times 1 sixth. And now when we take the derivative of this, Second, so second attempt now, second attempt. Now when we take the derivative of this, we'll get exactly this because the six and the one six will become one and then the four and the four t cubed and the one fourth will go away too. And we'll have exactly this. Okay, does it make sense? 
How would you know um, without checking it to do the one fourth? Um, you, you, I mean, you're just you're checking it in your head. You're thinking, okay, when I do the derivative, it's four t cubed. Well, I don't have the four here. So, okay. so, so either, yeah, either it's a it's a written check or it's a mental check. And the goal is, okay. the goal is to get to where it's a mental check, right? So it's you're imagining the derivative and thinking, do I have all my, my ducks in a row with with constant multiples? Oh, there's going to be an extra four when I take the derivative of this, a four that I don't have. Okay. So, does that help? Yeah. Okay, so then we're going to, like we said before, we need a fundamental theorem. So we're going to go from A to X. Now that we have the antiderivative, we're going to evaluate that at X and evaluate that at A and subtract. So it'll be, I'm going to do this 1 24th. So 1 24th times A plus X to the 4th to the 6th minus 1 24th times A plus A to the 4th to the 6th. And so that is what, that's all possible net accumulation functions that have this as the rate. And why is there more than one? Why is there more than one net accumulation function with this as the rate? You're really quiet. I can't quite hear you. We're accumulating from different values. Right. Different, so different starting values, right? All the different starting values, any possible value of A makes for many net accumulation functions. Okay, so if this starting value of A is just a number, then what about this whole thing? This minus, so this is the minus f of A. Isn't that just a number? Yeah, it's just a constant. This is just a constant, right? So rather than write this whole thing out, it's just some constant that's based on our starting value of A that we picked, or you know, if there was one. So it's just a number, it's just a constant. So an alternative way that we'll write this is 1 over 24, a plus x to the 4th to the 6th. Instead of minus all this stuff or minus f of a, which is just a number, we're going to say plus c. So the plus c is from the fundamental theorem. It's, it's equivalent to the minus the antiderivative evaluated at our starting point. So c equals minus f of a where capital F is the antiderivative, evaluated at A. And so we can just write our final answer this way, knowing that that plus C is the minus F of A from the fundamental theorem. So you've been writing all, it's a, in your calculus career, you've been writing plus C, plus C, plus C, and did you know what that was, right? So what that is, is from the fundamental theorem, we got final value of the quantity at X, minus the initial value at a well that minus the initial value at a that was that's what the plus c is about that's what the plus c is okay questions on this example so we got our what and so then the, the uh, sometimes the homework and the and the online text uses this um, this term principal antiderivative Okay, so the principal antiderivative is where c is zero. Okay, so that's the one antiderivative with a plus c of zero. So it's just this part of it. You don't write the pl plus c; you just write that. Okay, so that's one of all the all the possible uh, rate functions, or sorry, accumulation functions that you get from an indefinite integral. The one where c is zero is called the principal antiderivative. Okay, questions? Um, so for the function, um, I know we're using the chain rule, like anti-deriving basically with the chain rule. Uh -huh. this. Um, so what I'm trying to get at, at least what I'm, how I'm understanding it, is that we're trying to figure out what the, the derivative of, the, of um, the chain rule is and try to go backwards from there. Yeah, we're trying to recognize that the rate function that we have with the result of chain rule. Okay, because like uh, t to the third is clearly the derivative of eight plus t to the fourth. Um, but right, so that's, that means it qualifies for the chain rule. And so okay. now we're going to apply this. This is going backwards on the chain rule now. Okay. Which means we focus on this one. 
and just do the antiderivative of g. All right, perfect, thank you. Okay. All right, let's do another example. <clears throat> okay, here we go. So another, so here's another, uh, we've got another indefinite integral. Okay, and we know that means our net accumulation from a to x. Now, what's different about this one that's different from if we're on the lookout for the, for the chain rule here? What's different here? It may not be obvious which the interior or exterior function is. Okay, before that, before that, does this, does this have the form that we're looking for? It doesn't look like it's being multiplied. Yeah, right. It's a quotient, right? Yeah. So when you have a quotient, it's still a product. How can we make this a product? You would say that it's like cosine over one, or like sine to the fourth x, uh, or one over sine to the fourth x multiplied by cosine. Right. X. Okay. And what is one over sine to the fourth x? What is that? Give it a negative okay. exponent. Yeah. So sine t to the negative four. Okay, I'm going to use my, uh, we're going to use our net accumulation form, a to the x, using t in the rate function, right? <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> and so uh, now, we, now we're going to check. We're going to check for this form. Do, do we have the form that we need? Do we have the derivative of the interior function of uh, the other part? Yeah, it's just cosine t. Yeah, cosine is the derivative of sine. So it, it fits the bill, right? So this this could be a this was a chain rule derivative because when you took the derivative of the inside, there it is, cosine t. So that's what we're looking for. So that's that that's step one, check, right? We check, it's good. And so now we're gonna focus on exhibit A or exhibit B. Which one of those is this? A or B? B, right? So we have a composite function, and then we have the derivative of the inside over here. So we're going to focus here. And it's just a matter of doing the antiderivative of the outside, right? The, the, the kind of the exterior function. So antiderivative of something to the minus 4 is what? So this is our first attempt. Sine of t to the minus 3, and if we have minus 3, we'll need minus 1 third, right? Thinking about taking the derivative, minus 3, to kind of make that minus 3 go away, when we multiply, minus 1 third. Okay, and so that's our, this is what, this is like our first attempt, right? And all we have to do is kind of clean up the mess, like figure out what, if we need to in include another constant multiple here, like we did in the last one. So we're going to check by taking the derivative, and compare it to the original. So negative 3 times negative a third is? So here's our, oh, and then times. So if I have the chain rule, so, so negative 3 times negative 1 third sine t negative fourth times cosine t, which is? Sine t, this goes away. Sine t to the minus 4 times cosine t. Is it exactly the same as what we started with? Yeah. Yes. Check. We're done. Okay. So it's going to be, so then we're going to evaluate that from a to x, knowing that when we plug a in, that's just going to be a constant. Right? So it's going to be sine of x minus 4 cosine of x minus, we'll do it one more time, just so we remember what this plus c is about, sine of a to the minus 4. No, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's this. So I'm, I'm writing the result rate function. So we want a to x of this. Sorry. 
If you're if you were uncomfortable, good. I just was doing a to x of the rate function, right? So we need a to x of the antiderivative. All right, so it's going to be negative one third sine of x to the negative three minus negative one third sine of a to the minus three, and all this is just a constant. Does it make sense? So this is what? This is our all net accumulation functions, <clears throat> starting from any value of a, such that this is the rate of change. Cosine x over sine to the fourth x is the rate of change. Right? So this, it's this, these are the same thing. This is the net accumulation function given in open form, given in closed form. So it's the net accumulation of a quantity whose rate of change is cosine x over sine to the fourth x. Questions? All right, try another one. Is there a question? Yeah, I was just wondering uh, quickly. So the rate of change is the derivative and the net accumulation starting from A is the antiderivative, is that right? Yeah, so, so our net accumulation function is this, and we know that's our rate function, right? To get closed form, we need the antiderivative of that. And the antiderivative of that is like it's our quantity function. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Other questions? All right, let's do another example. Okay, how about this one? So again, we're gonna start this one by writing it as a product. Let's do it one more time. Let's use our T's one more time. We just gotta, when we do these, just gonna remember that it's the same net accumulation functions that we've been doing all semester. All right, and this is to the minus one. Okay, so does it fit the bill for this? Could this could this have been from the chain rule? Well, is what's the, what's the rate of change of this? Well, it's minus nine. It's just a constant. And we have just a constant out here. So that's that's fine, right? We have the right power, right? So that it's the power of, of t to the zero. And we have the power of t to the zero out here, right? Constant derivative, constant out here. So step one, check. It meets that fits the bill. And we're gonna focus on this one, right? And so we got uh, the exterior is negative one, so we're gonna raise the power to zero, right? And then we're gonna do one over zero. And we're ready to check our attempt. But what is anything to the zero? It's one, right? And so, hmm. So we have some warning bells going off here because we just lost our function to the zero and we're trying to divide by zero, okay? Which uh, that only Chuck Norris and my daughter can divide by zero. Those are the only two people who can. And so, uh, this isn't working, right? So, so this is a red flag, right? Red flag. We're getting all kinds of warning bells here. Danger, danger. Okay, so we go back to this and we look. We say, look, the power rule is not working. If this is the derivative, so something is something else, right? What derivative is ends up being to the negative one? Our natural log. Yeah. So this is the one case where the you're not going to use the power rule because. A uh, one over or uh, to the negative one is when that's the derivative of natural log, and so that's what that needs to be our first attempt. So if you forget that and you start doing this, you get plenty of warning that you're on the wrong track, right? Your function goes away, and you try your you got one over zero. These are bad things, right? Bad, bad. Okay, it says go away, try again, start over. Okay, so then remember, oh right, so if the derivative of natural log is is 
negative one power. Okay, so here we go. So uh, we're going to do the natural log of, okay, and we're going to need, and uh, we don't have time to get into the reason why, but we are going to need absolute value around that 2 minus 9t. It's a domain issue. Like I said, we don't have time to get into that right now, but uh, we're going to need, uh, when you do the natural log as an antiderivative, you're going to need to put absolute value around that argument, unless that argument's always positive, right? So if, if it ends up being like x squared, or you know something that's always has to be positive. That's the one time you can get away without having the absolute value. But you can always put it on there and to be safe. Okay. So here's our first attempt. It's going to be the natural log of that. We can check it. What do we get? The derivative is one over two minus nine t times what? Negative nine. Times negative nine. Okay. What do we have? We have six. So we need to have a six, but we need to get rid of the negative nine. So what's our second attempt? We need a six that we didn't include the first time, but we don't want the negative, negative nine, so we're gonna do negative one ninth. Which is negative two thirds. And we're just gonna to skip to the last step. We know we're gonna plug in our x and plug in our a. When we plug in our a, that's just our plus c. I went a little fast on that one. What do we think? Anybody have a question before we, before we go take the quiz? Uh, is it really not important that we know why it has to be the absolute value of 2 minus It is important. Nine? We just don't have time at the moment. <laughs> but just briefly, it's because natural log only accepts values that are positive. Right? Natural log only has a domain that's positive. But this function is has can that can be negative or positive. It just can't be zero. So we're allowed for that to be negative, but then the natural log of it has to work. So then we have to make it positive. That's in a nutshell.